seven o'clock. We have a few more people willing to join, but um, I guess for the sake of time and those that have already connected in, um, I'd like to get the February Aula Public Forum open. Um, for those of you who are joining us who are friends of Ala, I'm Ann Rob's son, the current president of Ala. <laughs> and every other month we hold these public forums on some uh, important topic that's um, been on our mind. So thank you for coming out, well, staying in your warm, cozy home here tonight and, and joining us for a short while. Um, before we get started with tonight's presentation, I would like just to make one announcement about our upcoming Bob Brower Scientific Symposium. It is scheduled for Saturday, March 11th. And we are, um, we are, are most um, grateful in having recently received a, a very generous sponsorship to the Bob Brower Scientific Symposium. And I wanted to recognize Jilda Brower for her generosity with that. Um, very, um, very nice of her. And it keeps our efforts going for our educational purposes throughout the community. So enough about that, but mark your calendars for the 11th of March. I'd like to um, turn this over to Dave Carr. Dave, I um, ask that you would be kind enough to introduce our speaker this evening. And while we do that, we'll just put our mics on mute so that we can listen. Thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy. Uh, my, oh, I'm not muted. Good. Yes, good evening, everybody. I will add, though, that we have for the Bob Brower Symposium, uh, we have just, as in uh, late this afternoon, got the registration fully up and running. Um, so we're gonna do a hybrid meeting this year. Uh, so in person at the Auburn Public Theater and all, all the presenters will be there and that's a great opportunity to network and maybe, maybe meet the presenters and ask them questions directly, but we're also gonna be broadcasting with Zoom. Um, so you can take your pick and um, register for either of those. Uh, go right to the home page. Uh, there's a big thing right there on the home page that'll lead you to the registration page and so on and so forth. And don't hesitate to ask us if you have questions. Uh, moving on, uh, Matt Gallo is here tonight with us. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Matt um, at the Finger Lakes Institute for a couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have very many opportunities to work with him one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but he's a neat guy and a very, very clever guy. <laughs> Um, but he is currently the Terrestrial Program Outreach Coordinator for the Finger Lakes PRISM, and he will explain what PRISM is, I assume. Um, he originally was working with PRISM on the Hydro Hydrilla Strike Team back in 2020, and Hydrilla is a really aggressive, bad uh, aquatic plant, invasive species. Um, and now he's uh, working on looking to prevent the spread of terrestrial invasive species like spotted lanternfly and hemlock woolly adelgid, which we are very familiar with, with and many others. Um, he works, uh, a lot of what he does, uh, he works to increase the region's invasive species early detection capacity, and he'll probably tell you what that is too, by educating the public on how they can help tackle a species, the invasive species. And he does this through uh, volunteer, running volunteer programs, Basic species surveys and educational workshops. Um, and he's a he graduated from SUNY ESF uh, environmental science and a minor in native peoples in the environment back in 2019. So he's he's one of these young guys, but he's really sharp. <laughs> I give him a hard time. Um, so anyway, he's originally from Long Island. Now he's up here with us. We're very happy for that. So Matt, take it away. Sweet. Thanks, Dave. Um, I will share my screen. I will minimize this. And because I'm working on two monitors here, folks, um, I am going to. You just muted yourself. Sorry about that. I meant to stop my video. Excuse me. Um, I, I, I'm working on two monitors tonight. So um, I want you to look at my profile. Um, what screen are we looking at? Are you, can you see? Um, we, see, we see your screen and your notes screen as well. Okay. Or the, uh, the next slide screen, I mean. Okay. 
So how about now? Did that change anything? No. Okay. Uh, this is the problem with working on two monitors. I apologize for that, folks. All right, let me just unplug this and I will just work off of this monitor. All right, let's see what we got here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Let's see. Oh, get out of here. Come on. There we go. Okay. How is that? Looks great. Great. Awesome. Thank you. I apologize for that, folks. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about invasive species. We're going to talk about climate change. We're going to talk about a lot of different um, topics tonight. So we got a lot to get through. So without uh, further ado, let's just dive right into it. Um, so just a little bit about myself before um, we kind of get to those sort of larger topics. Um, I, um, Dave had it a little bit outdated there. I am the now the Terrestrial Invasive Species Coordinator for the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. So uh, we kind of shrink that really big title down to Finger Lakes Prism. Um, and basically what the Finger Lakes Prism is, is we are a public-private partnership between the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva and the New York State DEC with the goal of advancing invasive species outreach, education, and management in the broader Finger Lakes region, right? So when we're thinking about invasive species, there's a lot of different people involved when it comes to um, when it comes to, you know, sort of tackling this huge issue, right? And so we have the federal government that's doing stuff at the national level. We have the New York State doing stuff at the statewide level, but you know, who's gonna talk to the, you know, Owasco Lake Watershed Association, right? That's where we come in. We come in to be your local invasive species experts so we can provide that sort of boots on the ground expertise and be a resource for, the, for local communities. So we cover 17 counties in the Finger Lakes region. So we cover everything between Rochester and Syracuse down to uh, Plimpton and Ithaca, huge parts of the Southern Pier, lots of land that's south of Lake Ontario and north of Pennsylvania. Now, we aren't the only group in New York that does this sort of work. We are one of eight regional prisms in New York State. So we have sister organizations that basically do the same work that we do, just in different parts of the state. So if you go out towards Buffalo, there is the Western New York prism. If you go out to the Adirondacks or the Adirondack prism, Long Island has their own prism and sort of so on and so forth. And I just want to stop here before we really sort of dive into things, because when we're talking about invasive species and we're talking about climate change, you know, we're talking about these, these really complex, um, really sort of new problems that we're dealing with, you know, we're thinking like big picture. And there's a lot of research that has been done on both of these subjects and how they sort of play <laughs> off of one another. But there's still a lot that we don't know. And so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page before we really start talking about invasive species and climate change to make sure that we're, we understand that while a lot of what I'm going to say to you is, is obviously backed up by the latest research and, and sort of my, my, our own knowledge here at the PRISM, there's still a lot that we don't know. So I won't have the answers to everything. And there certainly could be um, lots of new surprises in store for us as both of these problems continue to sort of advance in the future. So that being said, let's talk about invasive species. What are they? I know you guys do a tons of work with invasive species already, but I, I wanna make sure that we're sort of in, in, in the same page when it comes to what, what is it, what does it mean for a species to be invasive? So I think these three pictures do at least a really good job of showing us when we're talking about invasive species, the scale of the damage that they cause. So each of these different pictures is a different invasive species. So here in the top left, we have a forest in Pennsylvania back in the 80s. You can see um, this picture was taken in the middle of summer and all of these brown areas are trees whose leaves were defoliated by spongy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth. Spongy moth is one of the um, uh, worst terrestrial invasive species we've seen globally since its introduction to the U.S. in the 1860s, and we've certainly been dealing with it a lot over the past few years. And we can really see, you know, the scale of their impacts with this bird's eye view photo. It's really a lot of damage that they can cause, affecting an entire landscape, truly. Really. Down here in the bottom left, we have this car that was being pulled out of the lake. I'm not really sure where this was taking place, but you can see that this car is covered in all this crud. And you know, this is Aula. I think we all kind of know what 
this crud could was likely going to be. Um, these are zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are one of our worst aquatic invasive species. They are um, numbered in the trillions here in North America, and they have completely changed the way that our food webs are structured and are function. Now here on the right, this is an invasive species that thankfully we don't have in upstate New York, but something like climate change might have something to say about that. Uh, if anyone's ever gone down south in places like Virginia or the Carolinas and you've seen vines covering trees on the side of the highway, you have seen this before. Um, this is kudzu. This is known as the vine that ate the south. We could see here, again, the scale of the damage that something like kudzu was able to cause. Um, all of these trees and all of this ground cover have been basically swallowed by kudzu. And so I think it's really fascinating to sort of look at invasive species this way, because not only do are we getting a sense of how much damage they're capable of causing, but, you know, we're talking about very different organisms here, right? We're talking about a vine, we're talking about a mussel, and we're talking about a moth. So we're talking about organisms that are on very different branches of the tree of life, but are causing, um, but each uh, on their own are capable of causing extensive damage, as we can see. And so what is it about these three species and others like them that make them so uniquely capable of causing destruction? Well, when it comes to defining what an invasive species is, um, there's a lot of different ways we, we can define it. We can have the whole presentation tonight just being about what is an invasive species. But really, the sort of quick and dirty answer to it is an invasive species is any organism that is non-native to an environment and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So it could be one of those things, it could be a couple of those things, or it could be all three. So invasive species can cause damage in a lot of different ways. And generally, when we're thinking about these different organisms, characteristics that they share that make them so successful are things like that they have a really high reproductive rate. So these are species that pump out lots of seeds and lots of eggs really quickly. Um, they're really aggressive. So these are species whose populations expand really, really fast. They don't waste time. Um, and often in their new environments, these invasive species have no natural predators. And we, a big reason for this is we think of them as having, um, as being the potato chips of the environment. Oftentimes it turns out invasive species have really low nutritional value or might be toxic in some way. So even though, you know, we have a scene like this with this kudzu here, and you might think all oh, this green is going to be perfect for the deer to eat. Deer are not going to touch kudzu. They do not like it. They're going to be going after the native species instead. And finally, invasive species are really good at taking advantage of human disturbance. And I don't think this is something that gets mentioned often enough. And what I mean by human disturbance is as we humans continue to change the landscape of our planet, as we build roads and highways and suburban developments, well, it turns out that in these new environments that we're creating, invasive species tend to do really, really well. And when we're thinking of disturbances, um, you know, climate change is really the ultimate disturbance. And the effects of climate change destabilizing um, our intact healthy ecosystems is going to allow invasive species to spread um, into those regions. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself there, but sort of a, a, a foreshadowing of what we're going to be talking about just in just a little bit there. And of course, you know, it doesn't have to be something like wildfires. It could even just be something like flooding from sea level rise or from a hurricane that is stronger because of climate change. Um, and yeah, these are sort of the species that would be spreading. <laughs> um, so sort of um, an example there. So how does this happen? Like how do invasive species move across water bodies? How are they able to, to transport themselves to new environments? So there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different pathways that invasive species are able to spread through. Um, and sometimes they can be introduced intentionally or they can just be introduced by accident. The common thread between all of these introductions is that it's caused by humans in some way. And it could be through things like the international, like international trade. It could be through things like the pet trade. So like in this picture down here, don't release your goldfish folks into Alaska Lake. They probably will survive. Um, see through things like landscaping plants or just hitchhiking on various vehicles we use. But when we're thinking about invasive species on a global scale, and we're thinking about where are our invasive species coming from? Here in the Eastern United States in sort of the temperate zone, we are getting our invasive species from um, two regions of the world. And that's usually either Europe or Eastern Asia. And um, there's two reasons for that. For one, these are the two parts of the world that are the most 
similar climactically to our own. So these are places with four seasons. They have hot summers. They have cold winters. They can survive our um, extreme temperature changes, right? Something from like Brazil, you know, maybe we could get some invasive species from, from Brazil, but it's not likely, you know, when you think of something like the Amazon where it's hot and it's humid and it's wet all year round, they're not going to really be able to survive our winters, right? And the other main reason why these two parts of the world are sending so many species to us is because these are just the two parts of the world that we in the United States are the most tied into. These are the most places where we have the most trade going back and forth. These are the places where we have the most tourism going back and forth. And so as we are crisscrossing the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, invasive species are often coming along for the ride. And really, you know, this map is a little um, not exactly correct because these arrows should be pointing in both direction, directions. Just as we are getting invasive species from a place like France or a place like Japan, we are also sending our own native species to those regions as well, and they are causing havoc over there. So this is a two-way street. I feel like it's important to consider here. Now, when invasive species arrive in a new place, they cause a wide variety of costs. So we're thinking economically, impacts on agriculture, on forestry, on tourism, environmentally, we're thinking about impacts on biodiversity, on structural diversity, on aesthetics, and even on human health. When we see invasive species show up, we see decreases in water quality. We see increases in flooding, and even in some cases, disease and illnesses. And these aren't just sort of abstract topics. We can put the real data behind us. So for one, invasive species have directly contributed to hundreds of species extinctions worldwide. And this is especially true on islands. If you think our invasive species are bad, places like Australia or New Zealand or Hawaii have been really badly hit by invasive species. Just look at the cane toad over here. And even in places where invasive species aren't causing extinctions, they are causing the decline of thousands and thousands of more invasive species. And in the United States alone, you know, even economically, it's a huge cost to us because we collectively spend $120 billion every single year controlling invasive species. So that could be money that maybe you're spending to remove some dead ash trees that were killed by emerald ash borer in your front yard. Or that could be money that New York State is spending to control something as large as, as spotted lanternfly or hemlock woolly adelgid. Either way, the collective economic impact of invasive species is huge. And all of this is being compounded by the fact that our world is quite literally on fire right now, right? All of these problems are made even worse in the context of climate change. And I'm probably going to be repeating myself a lot tonight when I say this, but these problems, invasive species and climate change, they don't exist in vacuums. They play off of each other. And so as we see invasive species spreading throughout our planet um, and climate change is continuing to warm the world, um, they are absolutely making each other worse. So how does this happen? How does climate change, for instance, affect invasive species? So this is the topic that we know a lot more about. When we think about it the other way around, that's an interesting discussion, and there's still a lot more research that should be done, and we'll talk about that later. But when it comes to in climate change and invasive species, this is really what we know about more now, how the climate, how climate change is affecting the spread of invasive species. So there's a lot of different ways that this can happen. So for one, um, a warming world allows species to invade from new regions. So this could be moving northwards or southwards, or it could be moving in up in elevation as temperatures continue to warm, species can move into these new habitats. Um, new pathways can open to invaders. You know, for one, you know, a lot of countries are starting to look at um, sending international trade through the Arctic Ocean now, because as the climate continues to warm, the ice pack is not as thick and it's not as large as it used to be up there. And as it becomes more and more open water, it's actually a really convenient way to move trade between the Americas, Asia, and Europe. So new pathways are going to be opening up to invaders um, as, you know, these shipping lanes open. Um, and a, really a big one here is that Climate change is going to cause a lot of stress to our ecosystems. As our native species are dealing with the consequences of climate change, as they're having to shift their own ranges northward, as they are dealing with longer periods of drought, as they are dealing with um, you know, higher summer temperatures, this is going to be really hard for them as they're dealing with all these other problems to now deal with an invasive species coming in. That just makes it so much worse because how can you deal with all these other problems and now you have this other species moving in that's going to be doing just fine with climate change. 
And a lot of this is even going to be played on, on food webs and ecosystems. As we see um, climate change affecting our native ecosystems, we're going to see species moving northwards. We're going to see, in, in rare cases, actually, species even moving southwards. And this is going to decouple food webs. And what I mean by that is that let's think of a, a plants and an insect. And let's say this insect species feeds on a plant species. It's a herbivore, right? Like something like spongy moth, but a native moth species, let's think. So as we think of climate change, both of these species, the plant and the insect, are going to be moving northward. Well, the thing is, insects move a lot faster than plants do. And so the the insects are going to be able to move northwards within a couple of years, but the plants, it's going to take at least a few decades. And if it's a tree, it's going to take a few centuries for that population of that species to move northwards on its own. And so this is what we mean. We mean these, these food webs are going to become decoupled because these plants and animals are not going to be able to live in the same places at the same time as they used to because they know what, because they're moving at different rates. And so as these food webs become decoupled, invasive species are going to be able to move in and take advantage. And there's actually huge potential, of course, with all of this, for sleeper species to emerge. As we were talking about before, you know, climate change is really the ultimate disturbance. And as we see climate change happening, invasive species tend to do really well in new climate environments. And there's the potential for this idea of sleeper species to emerge. And these are species where maybe right now, these are non-native species that are in our landscape, but aren't really causing any damage. But with the potential stress that climate change can bring, that might be enough to allow for these species to emerge and then become invasive in and of themselves. So this is a lot of different stuff that I'm throwing at you guys right now. A lot of really big, abstract, sort of esoteric concepts, but there's just this is such a complicated concept, and there's just so many ways that climate change and invasive species are playing off one another. But really, when we're thinking about, you know, sort of the What's the biggest way that this is going to happen? Um, invasive species being able to move into new regions is really the main way that climate change is going to be affecting this. And again, just like what I was saying before, it's going to allow species to move from the equator northwards into new environments, but it's also going to allow species to move higher up in elevation up mountains in places where they previously weren't able to. So with all of this being said, let's dial in on some local examples of invasive species that we know could affect the Owasco Lake watershed. So I'm going to be talking about two species here as sort of like examples to help us better understand these sort of, again, these big abstract concepts. How is it going to affect us more specifically? So we have two examples here. One that you're probably, actually, I know you guys are really familiar with already because you guys do really great work with this invasive species, hemlock woolly adopted. But we'll talk, we'll talk about another species that um, you might not be as familiar with, but is on its way, don't, don't worry, um, the southern pine beetle. So we'll talk about both of these species in earnest and how climate change is affecting them and how that's going to affect the broader Owasco Lake watershed. So. Let's talk about hemlock woolly adulted first. So when we're talking about hemlock woolly adulted, and a lot of this, again, you guys have been doing really great work. I've, I've, I've talked a lot with Zaina before about um, uh, um, with, with what you guys are doing with hemlock woolly adulted, and um, you know, New York State Hemlock Initiative loves the work that you guys are doing. So some of this I'm going to kind of breeze through because I know you know it already, but <laughs> excuse me. This is what we're talking about, right? When we're talking about hemlock woolly adulted in sort of the abstract, the big picture, this is the damage that we see when hemlock woolly adulted is allowed to run rampant. This is a picture that was taken back, um, I think in the 80s or the 90s, back in um, in the Appalachians, I believe this was North Carolina, um, where they weren't able to deal with hemlock woolly adulted um, before it was able to get out of control. And, you know, unfortunately, this is what ecosystems look like when they are largely hemlock dominated and HWA is able to rip through. And an interesting point here is that we've actually never been able to find a single individual hemlock tree that is shown to be resistant to HWA. So scenes like this are to be expected in the future. And hemlocks are just so important. They affect so many different things, right? They're considered a keystone species. They're so important because they provide more shade than any other conifer, I think virtually any other tree in our region. Um, the way that they're able to cast shade and create unique environments beneath their canopies that are often cooler, often um, 
are more moist because none of that sunlight's getting through to evaporate the water. They create these cool, well oxygenated streams that are perfect habitat for things like our state fish, the brook trout habitat for an endangered species like the um, the hellbender, otherwise known as the snot otter down here. Um, and it's they're really important for um, fungi as well. If anyone has seen this fungus before, these are um, rishi mushrooms. They only grow on hemlock wood. And these guys are known as the mushrooms of immortality because medical research is actually starting to show that the compound chemical compounds that are found in these mushrooms are um, capable of producing amazing health benefits in humans. Um, it's been shown they can heighten immune system. They can um, improve your heart health. They can improve your lung capacity. Um, and so when we're talking about losing hemlocks, you know, we're not just losing forests like these. We're losing all of the habitats they create and the numerous, numerous species that rely on them. So there's just, it's, it's just a really complicated web, all these different species that we lose when we're talking about hemlocks. Now the basics of HWA, again, I know you guys know a lot about this already, but just for, in case some of you don't know, um, these guys were originally native to Eastern Asia. This is an insect species um, closely related to aphids. Um, these guys actually feed on multiple conifer species, but their impact here in North America is really only felt on Eastern hemlocks. And they are a tiny organism that feeds on sap by sucking. And when you go out looking for HWA, I feel like we kind of forget how tiny these guys are. HWA is super duper tiny. So these adelgid crawlers here, um, are these little specks are, are actual adelgid. And so when we're looking for HWA, we very rarely see the um, full grown um, adelgids themselves just because they're so tiny. Um, what we usually see are the white puff balls they create. We can see that right here actually. Um, this is not HWA, this is a, um, a biocontrol beetle. Um, we'll talk about that in a, in a little, basically it's a, it's a predator that has been introduced to feed on HWA. Um, but the way that HWA produces is so interesting because they create these egg masses that appear as these white balls and females are able to reproduce through a process known as parthenogenesis, which means that they can lay unfertilized eggs that are exact clones of the mother, which means that you only need one individual adelgid to cause an outbreak in the population. Um, one individual adelgid just landing on a tree and we could see how tiny these guys are. So it's really not hard for them to thread. All it takes is a strong gust of wind. All it takes is a bird. Um, you get one female adelgid that lands on a hemlock tree and she can start a whole new population all by herself. Um, so what does this have to do with like climate change? We know HWA is bad. Well, here is the range of Eastern hemlock in North America, this green area here. So we could see, you know, they really like the Northeast. They like sort of the northern parts of the Midwest, and they really like the Appalachian. So colder, cooler environments. So <laughs> when HWA was first found on the East Coast, they were found in um, the Appalachians of Virginia back in the 50s. And once they were established, they started moving throughout the Appalachians, and they sort of marched northwards. But see, the thing is, is once they sort of got to like the New York, Pennsylvania border, Catskills region back in the 90s, they sort of hit this wall, this sort of invisible wall, where they couldn't move any farther northwards. And the reason for that being is because it was too cold. It was actually too cold for HWA to live in upstate New York, and New England, and these parts of Canada. Well, I think we can kind of surmise that that isn't the case anymore. Um, if we look at the distribution of HWA now, and this map's a little outdated, we can see it's gone way past what that boundary used to be. And so the thing is, colder winter temperatures um, actually do a really good job of killing HWA, but frankly, we don't have the colder winter temperatures that we used to see, and it's not able to kill the adelgids anymore. And so we can see here that you know, the adelgids are moving into places like Michigan. They're moving up here in Nova Scotia and in Maine. And there are still regions of Hemlock's range where it is too cold for the adelgids to spread. And, you know, parts of northern Maine, big chunks of the Adirondacks, they still get cold enough temperatures for HWA to kind of struggle in, in moving in there, but that's not gonna be the case for that much longer. There's actually a study done um, quite a while ago looking at modeling the spread of HWA in, in Maine here. And so each of these maps of Maine represent a different, um, different climate regimes 
um, in, in certain years. So this map at the top is Maine in 2010, this map is Maine in 2020, and this map is Maine, what we expect it to be with climate change in 2050. And these different colors represent this susceptibility of hemlocks to HWA based on temperature. So areas that are red are places where it is warm enough for HWA to move in and have a high impact on, on hemlock. Areas that are green are places where HWA can move in, but they're not going to necessarily wipe out all the hemlocks. They'll have a moderate impact, but they're not going to necessarily wipe out every tree. And places that are blue are places where it's just way too cold for HWA to have any sort of impacts. And so we can see in 2010, you know, Maine is kind of broken up into thirds in this top map here, where you know the southern third of Maine is, is high impact, but you know, hemlocks are going to actually be okay in this northern blue area of Maine. Now, if we look at this middle map, this is Maine in 2020. So we can already see, even as of three years ago, this entire blue area where the hemlocks would have been safe, that's gone now. That's already gone. And half of Maine is already susceptible to HWA. And you can't really see it here. There's actually um, a little range map where they would expect HWA to be in Maine. And so the, I, I kind of outlined it here with this pink circle. So they would expect in 2020, HWA would be in the sort of like bottom quarter of Maine. If you look at the distribution of HWA in 2018, we, we can actually see that these predictions are pretty spot on. Um, and by 2050, they expect um, HWA to be in pretty much all of Maine. So there's really no hemlocks that are going to be safe anymore from the climate because it's just going to be too warm in the winter. And there's tons of studies that are showing this. Um, and not only are they moving northwards um, because of, of colder winter temperatures, but we're seeing that HWA eggs are actually hatching much earlier, is as early as December, outside, way outside of their normal spring and summer life cycle. So not only are they able to move into these new areas, but they're actually able to become more active for longer parts of the year. So that is a lot to take in there. So we can see that you know this invasive species is able to move northwards. It's able to extend its life cycle as a result of a warming climate. But you know when we're thinking about climate change and, and species moving northwards, we are expected to get a lot of species moving northwards here in New York from the south, places like the Carolinas, places like Virginia, places like Georgia. Is there any chance that these species down there that are native to the United States, native to North America, as they're moving here, is there a chance that they can be invasive? Well, the answer is yes. And this is kind of exhibit A when we think of species moving northward that are native species. This right here is the southern pine beetle. So Southern pine beetle is a wood boring insect. As the name implies, they feed on pine trees. And if you're familiar with emerald ash borer, if you're familiar with Asian longhorn beetle, it's basically the same idea as those guys. They bore into the bark, they eat the wood from the inside out, and they make all these little trails on the inside. And that eventually kills the tree. Oh. Southern pine beetle is a native species. It's native to most of North America, as we can see here. Um, huge parts of the South, even as Places as far south as New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and their range goes from Arizona all the way down into Nicaragua. So this is a species that's right at home in North America. This is not an invasive species. That This did not cross a continent. This was not introduced accidentally or on purpose. This is something that belongs here. But we can see this range here. It's a lot farther south, and New York is not a part of that. Well, here's the thing. This southern pine beetle is a lot more deadly as it moves north. Um, and the reason for that is, is because even though this is a native species to the southeast, this species is feeding on pine trees that it previously wasn't, um, previously haven't dealt with southern pine beetle. But before we get ahead of ourselves, what is southern pine beetle? Um, so like we said before, it feeds on pine trees by boring into them. It's a native species of Southeast. Just like it should be made, these guys are actually really, really tiny. So they're really hard to see with the naked eye, although they are easier to see than HWA. Now, the life cycle of HW, of, of excuse me, of Southern pine beetle is very similar to, to most wood boring beetles. Again, kind of already went over this, but they're going, adult beetles are going to um, mate and they're going to burrow through the bark of the tree. They're going to lay their larvae in there and those larvae are going to, create these chambers on the inside, they're going to feed on the tree, eventually they're going to pupate, they're going to leave, and then they're going to migrate as adults to new trees and start to cycle over again. 
Now, the thing is, is that there are ways for trees to fight off southern pine beetles. Not like something like HWA, where we've never seen in at least eastern hemlock, you know, native resistance to it. Pine trees have ways of, of defeating this pest, and that is mainly through pitch. So if you've ever have seen a pine tree or really any conifer that's covered in that in that sap, that really sticky substance on the bark, that's usually because when there is um, a, a hole made through the bark, as a natural defense mechanism against these insect pests, um, pine trees will release the sap and the beetles will get caught up in the sap as we can see here in this picture. So this little, this little black sort of oval shape here is the southern pine beetle getting caught in the sap. As they get caught in the sap, they'll get stuck and then they just sort of die there. Now, the problem is, is that like we were talking about before, the species that live down south, the pine species that live there, the, your slash pine, your longleaf pine, your loblawy pine, they can handle this just fine. But our species up here in the Northeast cannot, are not adapted to dealing with Southern pine beetle. And we can see, um, you know, if we go back to our map of Southern pine beetle, you know, it wasn't in New York State. But if we go to this map here of Long Island in 2015, we can see Southern pine beetles well established in New York State. So all of these points represent areas where um, pines have been found to have been infested with Southern pine beetles. So the pine barrens on Long Island right now are getting really hammered by these guys. Because again, Long Island used to be cold enough for Southern pine beetle, that is no longer the case. And if you're an observant uh, viewer here, you will notice um, they're moving their way up in to upstate New York. So we can see in Bear Mountain State Park here, there is an infestation in Minnewaska State Park. There's a couple of infestations and they are continuing to move farther and farther north. So the real concern here is again, <clears throat> a species of pine that live farther north that are not adapted to dealing with Southern pine beetle. And the real concern here is not necessarily the pines in New York. So the pines in New York that Southern pine beetle would be feeding on in upstate New York <clears throat> would be red pine and pitch pine. But the real concern is jack pine. This is a pine species that makes up huge swaths of the Canadian boreal forest. So all of this green area are areas where jack pine is um, present. And the thing is, as you start getting into these northern areas of Canada, you start losing a lot of biological diversity because it just gets really cold up there. And so in a lot of this green region, jack pine is one of the only trees. Like I would, so what I mean is like, you can think of this green area as quite literally the only tree that's in this place is just jack pine. So the, the fear is if Southern pine beetle gets far up north into this region, it's just going to be able to run like wildfire and wipe out this continent-sized forest in Canada. And as it moves northwards, these are going to be the effect. Huge die-offs of trees. Again, we're thinking, you got to think Alaska, northern Canada, these are huge undisturbed forests. No one lives here. It's just trees. And we stand to lose a lot of them. Southern pine beetle is able to get that far north. And as this happens, we're going to be dealing with a lot of dead tree stands and with dead trees comes wildfires. And so this is where invasive species start to affect climate change because as they start moving farther north, as they start to destabilize these forests and they create the perfect conditions for wildfires, well, all this burning wood is going to be releasing tons and tons of carbon into the atmosphere and contributing even more to climate change. So this is what I mean. Climate change and invasive species are a two-way street. It's not just that climate change is affecting invasive species. Invasive species can absolutely affect climate change and potentially speed it up. Now, how this exactly happens other than tree pests contributing to more forest fires, this is sort of where we, we're kind of in the dark in terms of what the science is really telling us at this point. There's really a lot that remains to be seen. But there are some interesting ways that we have been observing so far and in how invasive species can be affecting climate change. So for one, um, the most earthworms, believe it or not, are actually invasive. And so as earthworms continue to move farther and farther north, they actually release carbon that is stored by plant roots in the soil. And so as we see 
invasive earthworms continuing to spread throughout the world and they're changing our soil characteristics, they're gonna be releasing all this carbon from the soil into the atmosphere thus speeding up climate change. Um, invasive species are gonna be disrupting a native species ability to adapt to a changing climate. So there are absolutely going to be instances where you know, a native plant species or a native animal species is going to be able to adapt pretty well to something like climate change, but it might not necessarily be able to adapt to both climate change and invasive species at the same time. And of course, all of this is going to disrupt the ability of our forests to regrow. Um, as we're dealing with a changing climate, and as we're dealing with invasive species, you know, we might have a forest or an ecosystem that's going to be able to bounce back from climate change, but with invasive species moving in, with, um, you know, like southern pine beetle coming in and wiping out a bunch of trees, or hemlock woolly adult coming in and wiping out a bunch of trees, this is going to disrupt the ability of forests to regrow, and without the ability of our forests and trees to grow, we're not going to get the positive effects of them sequestering carbon from the atmosphere, right? That's what plants do. They, they are constantly taking in carbon dioxide. And so all all of this is going to play into the hands of climate change and make it so that our changing climate is just going to change that much faster. So, um, some other things that we're thinking about here when we're thinking about how is this going to affect Alaska Lake on, on sort of a bigger picture, it's really going to change um, our forest ecosystem. So right now, our dominant forest type in upstate New York are medical birch forests, right? Your sugar maples, your red maples, your American, um, American beaches and your um, your yellow birches. That's our dominant forest type. Well, St. New York is just going to get a bit too warm for those species, and they are, that forest type is going to migrate northwards into Canada um, as as the climate continues to warm. Right, a, a lot of that area where we saw the jack pine before. Um, in the future, um, oak hickory forests are going to become a lot more dominant. So a lot of these forest types that we see, you know, down in Kentucky and in Tennessee and in Virginia. That's going to be most likely, as we get our act together, what our um, forests are going to be look, looking like around Alaska Lake um, in, in the next century. And so it doesn't say it here. In the, in the sort of red um, maple beech birch forest, this is the same sort of forest that hemlocks like to live in. Actually matches up really nicely with the range of eastern hemlock that we saw um, just before. So. Not only are we going to be losing these three tree species, but it's likely that it's going to become too warm for hemlocks to live here, even if we didn't have HWA. So our fours were already at risk to begin with. Um, and of course, this is going to contribute to harmful algal blooms, right? Um, as we see a warming climate, of course, that's just going to increase the algal activity, and it's going to de destabilize the ecosystem within Owasco Lake. And we can expect to see more HABs in the future, for sure, when it comes to um, climate change. With all that being said, um, we talked about a lot. <laughs> we covered a lot of ground. We, we talked about, you know, um, invasive species moving northwards, and we talked about native species becoming invasive species because of climate change. There's a ton of topics and, you know, that we went over, and there's a lot of change in store for the future, no matter what happens. And it can seem really overwhelming, and it could seem really depressing at times. And so with all that being said, um, I want to make it clear that you can help us when it comes to um, fighting both invasive species and climate change. And because I'm the invasive species educator here, um, I'm going to talk about how you can help out and help us fight invasive species. We have multiple volunteer programs where you can help us detect invasive species as they're spreading such as our trail survey, our macrophyte survey, and our hemlock woolly adelgid survey. Um, and so if you are interested in helping us stop the spread of invasive species as they're moving throughout our region, as they're moving northwards, um, consider volunteering with us. These programs run year round. So we have our HWA survey right now. And during the summer, we're going to have both our trail survey and our macrophyte survey, um, which looks on invasive species, both on land and water in full force. So we have something for you any time of the year. Um, and you can just, um, I'll, I'll send this link in the chat later, but feel free to check out our website, fingerlakesinvasives.org. And you can find tons of information about exactly what these um, surveys entail. So. I just want to kind of leave you guys tonight on taking a step back and thinking about invasive species and 
there are a lot of invasive species and they've had a tremendous impact on our environment. And many invasive species, you know, we are losing and have lost the battle to. Things like emerald ash borer, things like zebra mussels, things like the chestnut blight and white nose syndrome, you know, these are invasive species where they're, they're, gonna, they're here to say, they're not going anywhere. And there are some invasive species that are so widespread, are so common that we have begun to think of them as being native species. You know, Kentucky bluegrass is not from Kentucky, it's from Europe. House sparrows are from Europe. Earthworms are from Europe. Dandelions are from Europe. And of course, the European cabbage white is also from Europe. So, so these species are here and they're here to say, but not all of these invasive species have to end up this way. We still have a lot of time and a lot of action that we can all collectively take to stop even more species from joining um, these lists of, of dangerous invasive species. So with all that, um, thank you guys so much for listening to me ramble on about climate change and invasive species. Um, I hope you were able to take something away from this. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Um, and of course, you can always reach out to me in my email address down uh, here. For any invasive species you uh, might be dealing with, I, I'd be happy to help you out in, in any way I can. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, I am going to join you again on video. And if there's any questions, um, happy to answer them. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Matt. Um, I did note, note down a few things that um, I had not been really thinking about how um, the new pathways of invaders, how it upheaves the whole food web. Um, native species becoming invasive species. That to me was interesting. You know, I always yeah. hear um, how sometimes invasive species can become native. I think of like horses as an yeah. example, you right. know, who had been here around. But um, when you really get to the very core of it, it is our earth is warming because of carbon. And what what can we do globally um, to help um, with controlling the temperature there? You know, that to me is yeah. like, OMG, how do you begin with that? <laughs> yeah. Now, bringing it down to very local, I love that you, you know, mentioned all of the studies you're doing, because at least those are things that our group can do um, to get out there and to help many of us, I know, love to take walks outside in the woods and, you know, love to observe things. So um, that was very helpful. But any thought about um, that global approach and how do we control the increase of temperature change? You know, is there any way that we can begin to bring it back? down? Yeah, um, <laughs> that is a huge question. <laughs> I will do my best answer that. Um, right before I answer it, though, I will just shoot the link down in the chat. If you are interested in volunteering with us, uh, feel free to peruse that at any point if anyone's interested. But okay, so how do, how do we stop climate change? <laughs> right? That's a huge, it's a huge question. Um, climate change affects in sort of very broad categories, sort of five different aspects of what humans are doing that are contributing climate change. So for one, energy, how we produce the electricity that is lighting our rooms and our houses and powering our society. We need to make sure that we are sourcing our energy from renewable sources, right? So that is having solar farms, that is having nuclear um, power plants, that's having wind farms, that's having um, geothermal, things like that. That's one. Two is transportation. So that is just electrifying the transportation sector. That's electric cars. Um, and for larger vehicles like, you know, like planes and container ships, um, electricity isn't really a viable option for those things. So that's um, probably using something like hydrogen to power those. Um, three is agriculture. Um, a ton of actual of climate change actually comes from agriculture. It comes from deforestation. It comes from um, in third world countries, you know, burning down the Amazon and um, converting that to farmlands, release tons of tons of carbon into the atmosphere. So changing our agriculture so that we are able to store more carbon in the soil, and that could be through something like cover crops. That could be through something like um, agroforestry systems where you're growing you know, trees with um, you know, your cash crops. That trees, you know, may maybe you're growing apple trees, maybe you're growing walnut trees that could provide some sort of um, assistance there. 
Um, four would be buildings. Um, so not just the energy that's powering all of our lights, but things like HVAC. So how are we heating our buildings? How are we cooling our buildings? Our refrigeration, our air conditioning, our, um, our heating, a lot of that you know, is separate from um, electricity that comes from the power grid. And so, you know, it's been in the news lately, but something like gas stovetops, like changing that to electrification, changing mm -hmm. your heating to electrification, um, having heat pumps heat your homes. Um, there is a fifth way that we can stop climate change, but it's not coming to me right now. <laughs> um, but those four main categories um, are ways that we can absolutely tackle um, climate change, when we're thinking big picture, global scale, what are the things that we need to do to sort of slow this down, addressing all four of those things. And actually, just remember the fifth one is um, the final one would be industry. So when we create products, when we create plastic, when we create steel, when we create cement, part of the chemical reaction process of creating those materials is carbon dioxide is a byproduct. So figuring out ways that we can make carbon-free steel, think, think, figuring out ways we can make carbon-free glass is going to be part of it. And that's the part of climate change that does not actually get mentioned as much as it should, because it's not really as catchy as some other um, ways we think about climate change, right? Like electric vehicles and, 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 and solar panels and things like that. Um, so we need to, to figure out a lot of problems. <laughs> it's, and it, it's a lot, but there's lots of different ways, the way I see it, there's lots of different ways that we can stop climate change because it, you know, it seems like it's so much, but you can just focus on one of those things and make it your thing, right? So if you want to decarbonize your house, well, put some solar panels on your roof, right? Make it so you're getting 100% renewable energy. Um, you know, you could get an electric vehicle. You could um, get a heat pump for your home to heat that during the winter. You don't have to do all of these things. You could just start somewhere and just sort of build off of that. So um, yeah, that's how we deal with climate change is sort of in a nutshell. Excellent. Yeah, some excellent ideas that we personally, with some a little bit of behavior change, we yeah. could, we could, as a group, make a big difference. Definitely. Great. Yes. I'm sure there are other questions. Go ahead. Hey, Matt. I have one. And this is probably not going to surprise you. Can you just briefly speak, just even bring up a couple examples of uh, macrophytes that are being affected by climate change? Because yeah, you know, sorry, stoneworts near and dear to my heart, but um, um, just real quick. Yeah, for sure. Um, surprisingly, there's like not a, at least from what I've seen, there's not like a ton of research on like macrophytes and climate change. No one's really doing like that much research on it, but like um, hydrilla would definitely be one. I mean, that's something they're definitely scared about in Canada right now is, you know, as hydrilla is spreading throughout Cuba Lake, it moving into a lot of those uh, more Northern lakes and the boreal forests. Um, Oh gosh, um, you're, you're kind of catching me flat footed here, Dave. I'm, I'm just been so focused on more terrestrial stuff. That do you know any? Are, 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 no, do you I, know? I don't, and, and I agree. Back, you know, it's only been a, a year and a half or something since I was doing this, but there isn't a lot on. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, macrophytes are your basically your aquatic plants of all different kinds, and and um, macroalgae. Um, but there, there is a lack of, of research or they just haven't figured it out yet. And I just yeah. wonder if you knew, you know, if anything, uh, there's been any major uh, changes, you know, warming waters affecting growth or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know like one thing that comes to mind, at least with like hydrilla is not only like the spread and see like the problem with like, not the problem, but like the thing with macrophytes is like, their pathways of spreading north through, through climate change are a lot different than terrestrial species, right? Because, because you are constricted to a body of water, it doesn't really matter like how warm that water body gets. You can't just teleport to like another lake, right? Like you have to get there somewhere, somehow. And climate change isn't really gonna change like those pathways, right? But one other thing I can think of at least how climate change is affecting macrophytes is with hydrilla, there is a, um, a bacteria that grows on um, hydrilla in the south that has been found to um, really adversely affect um, bird species, especially like birds of prey. They've been finding huge mortalities of bald eagles in places like, um, like Florida and Georgia from this bacteria that grows on the surface of hydrilla. And I would imagine that as the climate continues to warm, I know this bacteria likes warmer water. It's certainly possible that it can move northwards and start affecting um, you know, our um, birds of prey um, here in the Finger Lakes too. 
So that's just another way it could spread is spreading diseases that previously were restricted to warmer um, climates. But yeah, you're, you're right, Dave. There's just not a ton of data right now on, on macrophytes and climate change. Hey, Matt, this is Dana Hall. Mm -hmm. A question for you. So uh, a number of us, we join with you or, or other experts and we conduct a survey in the forest or the fields and so forth. And we do find in, an invasive species, let's just say lanternfly yep. as, a, as an example here for a conversation. Um, okay, so now the collective, we know that it's present, but then what can be done about it and who can do that what? Yes, um, I had a figure, I, I had a feeling um, someone would ask this question. So the main way when it comes to, you know, I found an invasive species, what do I do now? Um, is by joining our um, volunteer programs, um, we teach you how to use um, an app called IMAP Invasives. And through IMAP Invasives, you are able to report the spread. I don't know if you guys use this for your HWA work at all. But um, through IMAP Invasives, you are able to report the spread of any invasive species um, in our region. And it goes into a database that is used um, by us at the PRISM and any, any conservation player in New York State. So information that you upload to this database helps us basically um, get a better sense of where invasive species are, where they are spreading, and where they maybe are affecting critical habitat, maybe where they're spreading into new areas where they weren't spreading before. And so it really helps us prioritize our limited resources in terms of where we're going to go out and remove some of these invasive species. Because at the end of the day, um, when it comes to terrestrial invasive species work in the Finger Lakes, and I, yeah, I showed you guys that map before of the 17 counties that the Finger Lakes Prism covers, I am the only terrestrial person doing work in those 17 counties. It's just me. I can't be everywhere at once. So without the help of volunteers, we just won't know where invasive species are, which means you know, when we try to go out and control invasive species, we're kind of working blind because we're not getting the whole picture. And so with you guys helping us out, we have a much better understanding of, oh, hey, there's a new population of spinal lanternfly right in Auburn. So we can go tackle that before there's a chance to spread and start affecting local wineries, so things like that. So that's sort of the, the how helping us detect invasive species would then translate into broader action into helping us both prioritize and then eventually removing those invasive species. Does that answer your question? Um, almost, Matt, um, but um, pick an example. So the only only cure, not even the right word, that comes to mind is insecticide. Um, is then is much of the solution to tackle the whatever is found to go out and spray it with something that in turn has problems in the environment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so it depends a lot on the species. It depends on a lot uh, on a lot of the population size, the density. All of those factors are going to play a role. Even the time of year is going to play a role in what management techniques we're going to use to remove that invasive species. So certain invasive species in certain situations, it is virtually impossible to remove them without using some sort of pesticide. That's just how it is. Um, especially with things like Japanese knotweed or Phragmites, you, you can't pull them up. They're, you can pull them up as much as you want. Those things have such vigorous and resilient root systems, you're just going to be wasting your time doing it. But in other examples, um, if you're able to find a population of an invasive species that is new to a, a specific location and is small, you know, we don't go in just looking to spray um, like as soon as we find invasive species. Spraying is really our last option. And we, we have to use it a lot just because invasive species are just so difficult to remove. If they were easy to remove, then they wouldn't be invasive species, right? So when we think of it, we try to go through every other possible option beforehand. And many times we are able to remove invasive species without having to use pesticides, right? Whether that's pulling up a plant, whether that is um, you know, literally just squishing spotted lanternflies, right? We can we can still remove these things mechanically, and in some cases, right, as you're as you're familiar with, you know, with with biocontrols too, right, for for certain species, but that's species specific. So basically, this is sort of a long-winded way of saying we do use pesticides, but 
on our sort of checklist of like, okay, how are we going to remove this? We only use pesticides if removing it mechanically is not an option and there isn't a biocontrol available. If those two things aren't options, then we're left, we're left with pesticides at that point. But we always try to go to those things first because obviously pesticides have problems in the environment. Um, and we try to minimize that as best as we can. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Good answer. Thanks. Thanks very much. Good. Carol. Ah, I um let me put my hand down first. <laughs> okay. So um I guess the this was really informative. And my question is human intervention in stopping the spread of invasive species. Is our goal, I know in some cases we can wipe them, we can hold them back, but in most of the cases, is the goal just to st slow down this inevitable spread? I mean, it seems like with some of them it's inevitable. Um, when you're talking about the beetle and and even the hemlock bully adulged until we get something to keep it under control, I suppose. But um, it seems like we're are we slow just trying to hope to slow it down? Like what's the best we can expect in some of these yeah, cases? That's that's a great question, Carol. And so when it comes to invasive species, actually, um, I'm gonna try to pull this up real quick. Um, our goal is our main goal is not to slow the spread of invasive species. Slowing the spread of invasive species kind of becomes our last resort. Um, I'm just going to share. Let me find a better picture. Just give me one second. I'm going to share my screen for a second because there's a really good visualization that we can use to sort of help us understand how we work to stop invasive species. So this is a generalization here of how invasive species spread. And we call this the invasive species curve. <laughs> Excuse me. So we can imagine as we go from left to right, we are increasing in time. And as we move up the graph, um, the area that is infested by an invasive species is growing, right? Because they're just spreading more and more, their population is expanding. And as the area that they're infesting is growing, management costs of removing this invasive species higher and higher and higher. So what we want to do, our main goal here at the PRISM is not to you know, slow the spread. Like what you're kind of talking about, Carol, is long-term management, right? This thing is here and it's kind of inevitable. We're just sort of limiting its spread and li limiting the impact of something that's already here and we don't really have any realistic hope of getting rid of. Our goal here at the PRISM is not really to work with invasive species up here. It's to work with invasive species down here. By far, the easiest way to stop invasive species is just prevention. It's just stopping them from getting here in the first place. Um, if we could stop an invasive species from being introduced, well, then we never have to worry about invasive species, right? I'll be out of a job. That's kind of what we want. And so, what we try to do is focus our efforts not on the things that are necessarily the most widespread. And it's not to say that we don't do anything to stop these really widespread invasive species like our spotted landerflies, like our garlic mustards, our hemlock woolly adelgids, things like that. But our focus is really on preventing invasive species from getting here in the first place. And if they do arrive, eradicating those invasive species as soon as they start setting up shop, right? When they have a small number of localized populations, we can get rid of them. The goal is to prevent these invasive species from having their populations building up to the point where they start becoming so abundant, so common that it takes just too much time and too much money where it's just not feasible anymore to eradicate them or contain them and then we're kind of just stuck with long-term management at that point. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess we're we're fo you're focusing more on the lower part of the curve, the earlier yes. part of the curve. Can we hope to prevent them if the climate keeps working against us? Yeah, I mean, the thing about invasive species and preventing invasive species is obviously like as climate change continues to warm, we're not going to be able to stop things like southern pine beetle from moving up, right? Obviously, like that's already here in North America. We can't like just build a fence to like stop them from getting here. That's just going to happen. But, you know, we are in complete control of introducing even more invasive species from other parts of the world, right? All we have to do is just stop bringing them over. All we have to do is just have better checks on 
international trade and making sure we're just doing a better job of making sure that these species aren't coming along with our with our um, goods that we're trading. Yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me, my throat's kind of starting to give out on me. Um, it means that you know when we're planting, you know, uh, plants in your garden planting native species or non-native species that we know aren't going to become invasive instead of, you know, the latest fad from something in Japan, right? That's how um, the majority of invasive plant species came as horticultural plants, right? People brought these over because they were pretty um, and they wanted them in their gardens, right? So like we have complete control over this. So climate change is not going to um, really have any sort of say. Um, we have the say. And we have a lot of power in preventing these invasive species from coming out. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank you, Matt. I, I don't want you to be losing your voice. You've had a lot to share here in the last hour. I've learned a lot myself and I greatly appreciate all that you're doing. This is something that we can always be bringing back to our board to discuss of how we can further be helping and assisting in future surveying. And we always have Dave Carr. He's always such a strong proponent of all this. So <laughs> we're very helpful and we're very grateful for that. Um, before we close, I wanted just to share that our next public forum will be that first Wednesday mm -hmm. of April, which is April 5th. And um, we'll be um, hoping to see many of you um, at that particular presentation. The topic is to be announced, but um, mark that on your calendar. Appreciate your time tonight, everyone, and thank you for your attention. It was great. It was informative, good questions, and um, you have Matt's email if you want to contact him with anything additional. He has put several things on this in the chat box for us, um, so be sure to, to get that before we end tonight. Um, so again, thank you so much. Enjoy, stay well and healthy. And yes, clap for you, Matt. Job, Matt. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Appreciate it. You guys have been great. Uh -huh. Yeah, Thanks. we're fun group. Thanks again. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks.